No separation. Praise God. Romans 8 begins with the triumphal entry of the words, No condemnation. And they gather steam so that by the end we are made to feel Paul's all-out boasting and the assurances to Christians that there is no separation. Nothing can separate the believer from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And why would we not look at this today? This is the day we get to break bread together. And so we ought to remember what Christ has done for us. And this passage spells out the reason for which God the Father sent his Son and the Son's execution of his Father's will and the benefits that flow from him and his work to believers now and into eternity. Christ's work is something that is an accomplished work. It is a finished work at the cross and in his resurrection. He is seated at the right hand of God since he ascended, but he's now interceding for believers. It's something where he exercises a ministry towards the saints that keeps us from being spiritually condemned. Christ's work is something that is accomplished, but then it is also applied. And it is something that we ought to glory in, that we ought to cast our eyes upon what Christ has done and all of the benefits that we get from Christ's work at the cross as we remember Christ's death for us. Christ's death has an impact for us in the way we live today and the way that we will live tomorrow. Now, I cannot ransack this passage of all the rubies and gems that it has, but I have at least made off with a few nuggets to share with you. And the very, the greatest thing that we get to see is that there is this golden chain, a golden chain. And you saw this in verse 30. It stretches from eternity to eternity. It was forged in eternity, this golden chain with its links together in the decree of God. And it is unbreakable, linking together the several benefits of our salvation as a lifeline from God to us, throughout our Christian experience, and we will see it was even before our Christian experience. Verse 28, starting, says, And we know that those who love God, for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. We see in these verses how God thinks of things that the last will be first, declaring the end from the beginning. Often this verse is used to comfort a believer, to sustain a believer, and it is put out there uh, often by people. God works everything for the good of those who love him. But often it's used without understanding the context of this verse. The context does not diminish the glory of this verse. It actually heightens the glory. It expands the comfort that we have as Christians from Christ's work and from God the Father's work in his purpose for us. Verse 28, we are going to look at. Now, whether we translate it all things or God causes all things, to work together for good. It is clear from the context that God is the agent. He is the one working together. He's the one working all the things in our lives together. To what end? Good. Now, what's that? We'll come to that in a second. But for whom? For whom does God work all things together for that good? It is only for those who are believers, whom he designates as those who love God. Believers love God. Not perfectly. Not invincibly. But we do love God. There is a change that has come into a believer's heart where there is welling up a love for God. There is, even now in this life, 
some correspondence to Christ. The way he acted, the way he spoke, the way he lived in obedience to God. This is the love of God, 1 John 5 says, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Believers are those who love God. But not only that, we are called according to his purpose. It is not our purpose. It is not our will that is governing our life. We are not like Invictus, the captain of our own souls, the master of our own destinies. God's purpose. What is that? Well, that is connected with the good and is answered in the next verse. This is a beautiful, comforting scripture. And he starts the next verse four. Like, because, or here's why. God has predestined his people, the people just spoken of, for glorification. This kind of glorification that's spoken of in verse 29, he says, is to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That is the good that is spoken of in verse 28. God is causing all things for you and I as believers, the big and the small, the the joyous and the painful, the good, the bad, and the ugly. God is causing all of those things to work together to the certain end that we would be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Not only in life, in a small and oftentimes tedious kind of way, where our growth in grace is meager, but there is a climactic day when one day you and I will no longer struggle with the sins that we do this morning. We're no longer, we will even be temptable. There will be no temptation. That is that good, that we would be conformed to Christ's image. Just as Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead, that we would share in that resurrection. Our bodies not being subject to pain, not being subject to death. You cannot hurt a resurrected man or woman, and you cannot tempt a resurrected man man or woman. This is that good. The good is not a discount on the new tire that you had to purchase because the other one got wrecked. Well, God works everything for good. This is the, this is the good right here, right now. God gave me a discount. Well, that's God's grace. But God has something ultimately way better than that. That new tire will burn. It will decay. You will need a new one and a new one and a new one until you die and you don't need tires anymore. It is that climactic arrival at Christ-likeness in the very end. This is the thing that from eternity God had in his mind, in his contemplation, and in his will. This is his purpose And if God has purposed it, who can turn it back? Who can say to God, why have you done this? Or what are you doing? We can't hold God accountable. God has a purpose, and his purpose we get to find out for believers is that he would make us like Christ. And we go out and evangelize. We go out and preach the gospel. You ought not to use the words, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, right? Imagine Noah preaching from the ark of people swimming in the waters. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. This is what we are doing when we preach to unbelievers. They are on a crooked path. They are on the broad road. They are under the very wrath of God, and it is about to fall on them. God has love, and he has demonstrated that unquestionably in giving his son, Jesus Christ. His will is for sinners to repent, 
But as for his plan for unbeliever exhibit A, I have no clue. But for the believer, for the one who has repented and believed the gospel, that two sides of the same coin of conversion, you can know and I can know God's plan for me, his purpose for me, is good, and it is irrevocable. God will not turn from it. God loves me, I know, as a Christian, and he does have a wonderful plan for my life. But it may involve, as was God's wonderful plan for Peter's life, him being crucified upside down. It may involve sickness and toil and hunger, and thirst, and nakedness, and reproach, all for the name of Christ. But at last, the glory will be greater, so much greater, that we will be able to look back at life and say, no, that did not hurt me at all. Because now I'm here, and now I can never sin again. And I have Jesus and he, I can see him with my very eyes, my glorified eyes. And I can love him out of the fullness of my heart. And there is not a single thought that crosses my mind that is evil towards him. I never once can sin against him anymore. This is that good that God has predestined us for. That is what he had in mind. He had the end in mind right from the very beginning. And it is this that sets in motion, determining everything else, literally everything else. So, predestination. That's a thing. Now, how is it done? Now, someone asked me uh, one time uh, when I was entering, entering the church here, do you believe in predestination? My answer, it's there in the Bible. The word is in the Bible, so I have to believe it. Now, my answer then was how he does it is by looking forward to see who would believe and choose the, chooses them knowing that they would choose him, pointing to this very verse. But little did I know that this verse contained my own logic's demise. God has a purpose. God has predestined people to be conformed to the image of Christ. And it, it doesn't say that he foresees. He foreknew. And let me, let me just take you through this. And brothers and sisters, I, I'll let you know. I got a haircut this morning. Okay? My wife... Gave me a haircut. It was free, but it was professional because she's professional. <laughs> she actually has her red seal, so it is professional. I might itch under my shirt, okay? Approaching a subject like this might cause you to itch and feel uncomfortable, okay? This is God's word. Let's get into it, all right? It says... Those whom he foreknew. Whom, not what. Not looking forward in advance to what events would transpire. Not looking forward to see if there was faith or a positive response to the gospel. But whom he foreknew. And then secondarily... It says, those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. This obviously means if he foreknew everyone, everyone would be predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. If he foreknew everybody in the sense that he foresaw what would happen and looked forward to look for faith, and he scanned every single man, woman, and child in history then everybody would be foreknown. And if everybody was foreknown, then everybody would be predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. But it doesn't say that he foreknew everybody. There's those whom he foreknew. These he predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. It's these 
who have all things in their lives, the big and the small, the easy and the hard, the prickly and the thorny and the painful, and the contrary seemingly to God's will, working out for that end goal of I'm going to reach glorification. Come all the hell and all the high water that the world and the flesh and the devil can throw at me under God's sovereign decree. Him willing all of those things for my good, they cannot separate me from the love of God in Christ. You and I, since trusting Christ, that was a gift. And we come to know this. And we will never be separated from Christ. Foreknew must mean something more than foresaw. There's, pardon the pun, there's more to this than meets the eye. It is not him looking down the corridors of time. It is to know personally beforehand, to love, to set one's affection on, to choose. It was not to foresee merely. This we get to see heightens the love of God for us. Why would he love us? Why would he set his love on someone like me? What do I have to offer him? How could I recommend myself to God? You cannot. And it is like Deuteronomy 7, when he tells the nation of Israel, I loved you and I chose you out from among the other nations. You were not greater in number. You were not more powerful than those nations. I loved you because I loved you. We ask God, why did you love me? Because I loved you. This is all to the praise of God's glorious grace. He, it, God, did not merely foresee that we would be glorified, but it is his purpose that those whom he sets his love on, he designs this end goal. They will reach glorification. They will be like my son. They will behold his glory and be transformed into his image instantaneously. If God merely foresaw what he would do, what we would do, who gave God the hand he had to deal with? He seems more powerful than God. Rather, God is the one who ordained what would happen and brings it into effect. He chooses, he calls, he justifies, and he glorifies. He's the God who gives Cyrus his name hundreds of years before. Isaiah 45, for I name you, though you do not know me. Cyrus was born. His father and his mother gave him that name. And he went on to do certain things. God said, I already named you. You are Cyrus. You're my shepherd. You're going to do all of my will. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all my purpose, Isaiah 46, 9 to 10. Now Luther says, So far the apostle destroyed merely the hands, feet, and tongue of the wisdom of the flesh in the book of Romans. Now he wipes it out utterly. Now he makes us see that it amounts to nothing and that our salvation altogether lies in his hands. God absolutely recognizes no chance. It is only men who speak of chance. Not a single leaf falls from the tree without the will of the Father. All things are essentially in his hands, and so also are our times. Brothers and sisters, this is a word of comfort that we can go to God's word and see there, I did not love God first. He loved me first. And I only love because he first loved me. Why would he love a pitiful, poor, blind, naked, worm of a creature like me? It is merely his grace. Now, brethren, I know that this might ruffle some feathers, that at the sound of election and predestination, you suddenly rear up an array of arguments 
that from um, like a peacock puts up its train, suddenly there are a lot of arguments. And I, I don't mean to just bring this here as uh, I, I want to make arguments or make waves or anything like that. But as Paul told the Galatians, brothers, I entreat you, become as I am, for I also became as you are. I was in your shoes, but I have come to see that this is a glorious truth, that this is full of comfort, and that it is the consistent teaching of Scripture. This teaching has liberated and energized and stabilized me. And this, and I, don't hope, to, I hope not to take too long on this first link of the chain, but it is this first link of the chain that God forged that runs the rest of them together. Without this, you don't have calling. You don't have justification. And you don't have glorification. Without God predestining in his love, in his grace, all of the rest of it falls apart. But this is a golden chain for us. I would have been left on the left, equal to devil's eye. But God chose to exercise grace. He chose me and not I. I think on his infinite grace when shaken this poor clay. I remember his omni-grace, the sun that lights my day. When cast up and down with tempest, soul, look to grace and say, "'Tis by grace I spiritually exist. I'll rest on Christ always." Now, the rest of the links in this chain. Those he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. There is this invincible locking mechanism between the, this link and the ones to come. Like Leviathan scales. One is so near to another that no air can pass between them. They are joined to one another. They clasp each other and cannot be separated. Is a person predestined for glory? then that person will be called. Is the person called? Then that person is justified. Is the person justified? Then that person will be, will be, and can never not be glorified. Now you cannot say with assurance that you were predestined to be glorified unless you can say that you were called and justified. As 2 Peter 1 says, Prove your calling and election. How do you know that you are called, that you are chosen? Except by the fact that you have come to Christ. No man can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. For myself, I know I would have never come to Christ on my own accord unless God had been the moving cause, drawing me to him. Do you have a testimony? If your testimony is, well, God has already chosen me, and therefore I'm good to go. That is not what scripture says. Calling and justification are necessary, and if you don't have those things in your life, then you are not assured that you are elect and you are not assured that you will be glorified have you personally come knowing that you are a sinner knowing that you are a hell deserving slave of disgusting things that the devil loves you doing and brings you to hell and have you seen that there is only cleansing by the blood of Jesus and you have come and rested your heart upon him have you come to Christ if you have then you can be sure you were called that was something God did just as over here God predestined God is the one to call he's the one who acted in time and actually brought that summons to you 
You would have not thought of it yourself. It would have not blipped on your radar. It would have not crossed your mind. God did it. And if there is that, you can be certain that you are justified. And brothers and sisters, this is a glorious doctrine because we don't have to jump through hoops to try and make God like us. We stand before God with an invincible standing. He sees us in Jesus, his son. And we have the righteousness of God transferred to us just as surely as the sin of our soul was transferred to Christ at the cross. Jesus paid it all, and yes, all to him we owe. But now, we don't owe a debt. We have been freed from that debt. Our guilt is taken away. And instead, there is Christ's righteousness. All of the good works you haven't done. All of the loving your neighbor as yourself that you've not done, you've not lived up to, suddenly, in an instant, in God's perfect record book, is transferred to you. It's yours now. And you can't give it back. And he won't take it back. Now, glorification, what a word. Glorification. We just sang Amazing Grace, and in it, we talked about shining like a sun, shining like the sun. God's glory, that dazzling light that is beaming from him and beaming from the face of Christ. He was resurrected. And we see glimpses of his glory even before when the Mount of Transfiguration. We see his real, true character beaming forth from him. But now Christ is resurrected, and we will share in that same glory. It's not something we deserve, but it is something that we will be given. We will be given an incorruptible body, a body that will no longer decay. Aches and pains this morning, that will be history. Maybe we'll still sleep, I don't know. Maybe we'll eat for delight, but not for a need. We will never tire. You can run and not grow weary. You can walk and not faint. And you will never get tired or bored of God. That's glorification, where every single one of the thoughts of your heart is holy in God's sight. And that is something that we'll never be able to fall from. This is something to utter a hallelujah about. There was a fall. That did happen. But that is not a fall in a series of falls. I don't know if you've ever thought this way. That happened because, okay, well, God created this creation over here. There was a fall. There was a salvation. There was an eternity where there was glorification. And then there was another fall. And then another and another and another. No. God created once. There was a fall. God placed man in the garden under that test. Man was going to fall. Jesus had already been set apart as the one appointed by God to be the savior of sinners. And this is all to point to Jesus Christ. One day publicly, every eye will see our Lord Jesus Christ and we will gather before him and marvel at him, 2 Thessalonians says. We will look at him with adoring wonder. This is our savior. And like Thomas we will be able to put our fingers and our hands in his wounds. We will be able to look at those glorified wounds. Now this, sorry for the long introduction, this golden chain is the reason that Paul can burst out. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? If God has already done the harder thing, given his son and all that that entails, 
He was nailed. He was pierced. He was lifted up on the cross. And the wrath of God fell on him. God parted with his son for a time so that he could have us back forever. If that harder thing in God's economy was already done, then God can do a lesser thing of giving us all things. Of never having us separated from the love of Christ. To to God, that's the easier thing. It goes from the greater to the lesser. He's already done the greater. Now he can do the lesser. He's already given us a diamond ring. And then he gives us a paper bag to wrap it in. We, because of God's work in this golden chain of salvation, because of God not sparing his own son, but delivering him up for us all, can be assured with confidence, not with pretension, not with presumption, but confidence on God's word. He said it. He's going to do it. He brought me to salvation. He's going to keep me. This is not that kind of hope that has itself as its only merit. It being present in someone is all that it's good for. Well, I hope so. But rather we have a hope built on what God has said. Has God said it and is he not going to do it? Our hope is certainty. Our hope is standing on the promises of God. Resting on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. It is something God has confirmed and he has made it good with the blood of his own son. He can do no greater. And Jehovah's Witnesses, not the highest or the mightiest, the tallest, or the smartest, or the most beautiful archangel is sufficient to save a single sinner from sin. It must be a God-man, Jesus Christ, that saves multitudes of sinners with his precious and priceless blood. And if he's already done that, then guaranteed you believe in Christ, you will never be able to be cut off. He would as much cut his finger off, as cut you off. And no one from the outside can cut you off from God's love either. He would have as easy a time as dethroning God and unchaining all of the workings of heaven and earth by God's decree as cut you off from God's love. Well, this is why Paul is so bold and daring. Yes, he's a single man, Yes, he has seen Christ, and he's beheld his glory, and he was knocked off of his animal in order to find Christ finally. Those are the things that causes him to suffer all things for the sake of the elect that they may be saved. But nothing can separate him from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. This is why he was the way he was. Paul was assured of his election of Christ's complete and finished and applied work, knowing that God has done what he has done and that it was set in stone gave him fortitude. And brothers and sisters, this is what we need. We need to be reminded of this. If God has done it, he started it, it is yes and it is amen. He's not going to go back on it. Then I can live and I can suffer and I can die for Christ because I'm not going to be separated from him. He could fight with beasts at Ephesus and not whimper because he lost a little blood. He will remain faithful when Demas runs arms open into the bosom of the world because he knew that God had done it and what God had done and was doing and was going to be done, it is finished. It is his. He had already been chastised and capsized and circumcised and God had delivered them from him delivered him from them all. God is able to deliver us from tribulation and it will come our way. God is able to deliver us from temptation and from physical harm. God is able out of those things to work good that we would be conformed to the image of Christ. It was like piling more onto Paul's plate. And it didn't hurt him. 
And this is what it can be like for us. Is your plate full? Well, guess what? It's not going to separate you from Christ. It's going to be hard, but you have the assurance that what you're going through is linked to where you're going. You're going to be made like Christ one day. You can say, bring it on. You think that this is going to separate me from God? You think that this is going to make Christ love me less? What has he done? Were anyone to try and bring a charge against God's elect, God is stronger than that person. God is stronger than the devil and his charges and his accusations. It is God who justifies. And if it's God who says you are righteous in Christ, who's going to say otherwise? Who's going to challenge that? This is, this is our comfort. Who is to condemn? Is somebody going to be powerful enough to arraign you before God's throne and have you sit under the charges that you are guilty of and actually make it so that you will be condemned, that you will be damned and cast off from Christ forever, accursed. Far be it from God to do such a thing, who has already given his son, and Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. My advocate is with the Father. He's pleading my cause. His one hand is on my shoulder, and his other hand is on God's shoulder. And he has made peace between us. Now nobody can say anything against the believer and bring him to condemnation. God has already done so much. There's really nothing more that God could do. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now you might not feel this subjectively. You might not feel that perfect peace at all times where you just know Christ loves me. Even still, nothing will separate you from his love. Number two, remember and look at the objective evidence of Christ's love. He has died. He was raised. He is at the right hand of God, and he's interceding for you. That's how much he loves you. That's what we need to remember. His love for us is something that's already been demonstrated. So then is trouble, is distress. The distress of nations are the world calamities or the things that the world purports are calamities to be really scared about. Are those things going to separate me from the love of Christ? Not the least. Or persecution. Oftentimes we fear this. And we are called to remember those who are bound in chains, who are imprisoned. They also are in the body. We're to pray for them. We're to remember them. But brothers and sisters, is persecution going to separate us from the love of Christ? Christ is present in the prison there. Christ is with us, but he's also on the throne. Famine, nakedness, peril, sword. These are all the things that already came against believers in the Old Testament. For your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. This is a part of the Christian life. This is a part of being a lamb, being a follower of Christ. No, this is not going to separate us. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Death. You fear death. Believe. If you are a believer, look to this passage. Remember Christ's death for you. He's already gone there and he's come out on the other side in resurrection. He's gone ahead of you as your forerunner. 
and nothing can separate you from his love. Is that moment when you close your eyes in death going to be the thing that unglues you? Christ is loving you even through that momentary struggle. You lose your breath. You close your eyes and suddenly your heart goes kaput. Christ is loving you through that and on into eternity. And it is your crowning coronation day. There I am standing in God's presence. And he greets me with joy. And there are the angels around his throne. And there is hallelujahs. This sinner who had no claim on God, he took from the bowels of hell of the pits of misery, of a dunghill, of a disgusting life, and he's brought him from grace and now to glory. What can we even say to that? This is God's work. That is what your eyes will open up to and then will flow out praises to God for his great mercy. Neither death nor life, and this, <laughs> this is the majority of what we face, isn't it? Life. Life is full of things. You go to Ecclesiastes and everything under the sun is just vanity. And there's little precious gems in the midst of it that God in his common grace gives. But life, the perplexities of life, the times of life, the age that you're at, the maturity that you're at as a Christian, all of the different forces at work in life, not a one of that is going to separate you from the love of God in Christ. Nothing, nor angels, nor rulers. You've got rulers that are spiritual, and you've got rulers that are physical. Is Kim Jong-un going to separate the believers in North Korea from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord? Heck no. Is Justin Trudeau able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord? Absolutely not. Even less than Kim Jong-un could. Angels are powerful. An angel comes from heaven preaching another gospel. He's under a curse. Not an angel who is holy, who is mighty, can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Spiritual beings, which I think is the the word, the powers there, demons cannot separate the believer from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Things present nor things to come. Times change, but really it's just the same stuff over and over again. Not any of that is going to separate us. Brothers and sisters, these are the things that often we worry about. Well, what about this? What about that? What if this happens? What if such and such a thing happens over here, and then this is linked together with that? How is this going to affect my future? How is this going to affect the future of my children? You don't know. I don't know. But I know that it's not going to cut me off from Christ. Height nor depth. You could go anywhere on the earth. You could go to the moon. You could go to Mars with Elon Musk. You will not be separated from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. God is everywhere. God is love. And the love of God in Christ stays with the believer. Nor anything. Just, to, just so it hasn't, if it hasn't been clear already, just to cap it off and make sure that it's, it's exceedingly clear. Nothing else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. They can threaten the body, and they can do a good job of mangling it so that you're dead. But after that, they've got nothing they can do. You can't take my soul out of the hand of God the Father and God the Son, and you can't take the Spirit out from me. There's nothing that can separate the believer from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is all linked together 
with Christ's work at the cross that was outside of us, that was for us, and that was no thanks to us. Jesus accomplished it. And that was the execution of God's will from eternity. Brothers and sisters, things are going to come in life that look terrible and terrifying to us. Remain firm, looking at these things. As we celebrate the Lord's table today, remember what Christ has done. And then also, praise God, when we show forth the death of Christ, we do that until he comes. We know he's coming. And we know we are going to be caught up and glorified. We are going to see him as he is and be transformed to no longer have this humble body, but a glorious body like his. How do we use these things? Well, here's a few nuggets. Number one, God is in control of all things. This is the pillow that you need to just lie down on. God's in control. You don't have to fret. When life feels like you're out of control, here's a good hint. Here's a, here's a good, good word of advice. When life feels like you are out of control, remember, you are. It's not in your control. It's in the control of God. It's in the control of the one who has the whole universe in the palm of his hands. And he knows things better than you do. He has a will and he's accomplishing that. You don't have to turn to some, and it, this might sound crazy. It is crazy. But this is the things that we turn to in our sinfulness when we try to control things to such a degree that we excuse God from the equation. You do not have to turn to some form of, of ritual or destructive habit in, earn, in order to preserve some semblance of control, like cutting or self-harm. This I can control. I can control the pain that I feel. This is what people do. This might sound crazy. This is what people do in order to try and control things, nor fall into the other ditch of checking out completely Neglecting all responsibility, like those who choose escapist options, ranging from just mere despondency and depression to going catatonic to suicide. You don't have to escape. Take a deep breath, relax. God is in control, and God is your Father, and He has already provided His Son. For Abraham, he was spared the knife and the fire. He was spared the searing pain of him actually sacrificing his son. God, he did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. Martin Luther said, If we anxiously tremble at God's word and are terrified by it, this is indeed a good sign. If one fears that he is not elected or is otherwise troubled about his election, he should be thankful that he has such fear. It is not the characteristic of reprobates to tremble at the secret counsel of God, but that is the characteristic of the elect. The reprobates despise it or at least pay no attention to it, or else they declare in the ignorance, or sorry, the arrogance of their despair, well, if I am damned, all right then, I am damned. The word of God shows us not only God's sovereignty, but also our responsibility. Are you here today and with confidence you have drawn near to Christ and rested on him alone? His work is complete. Your work could never be complete. Your work could never be enough. You must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. You are to be holy as he is holy. There is no one who does good. No, not one. You and I have all, like sheep, gone astray, and we have turned each one of us to our own way. But the Lord laid on Christ the iniquity of us all. Have you yourself 
come and rested on Jesus Christ, believing he's able to save me. And then, brothers and sisters, we persevere, not just by mere tooth and nail, but we remember God has a handle on us before we have a handle on him. God is working all things together for that good, that we would be glorified, and it is finished, and I can rest in him. I hope that this is a word of comfort as we go through different seasons in life. We can trust God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are before you now, and we thank you for your great grace. Thank you so much for the grace that was given to us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. Thank you so much for the work of Christ that is perfect and complete, that, that Christ's blood was spilt, and that you saw what he had done. You are satisfied, and you have raised him from the dead and exalted him at your right hand. I thank you so much for the purchase price of our redemption and that you will never suffer us to be disconnected from you. You will love us, and you will love us with an everlasting love. Now we pray that as we meet here that we would return love to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, if we could have the, the men come forward and we will...